Meshuga may be known as the most brutal band to ever walk the planet, but they've got a melodic side too. And their lead guitar player, Frederick, occasionally lets it show by laying down some beautiful Alan Holdsworth inspired solos. But what's the driving force behind Frederick's furious fusion phrasing? On today's video, we deep dive into the solo section of one of the band's earliest tunes and find out. Let's check out the solo from Cadaverous Mastication. Hey there kids, it's your good buddy, Uncle Ben. Frederick from Meshuga is one of the most influential lead guitar players to hit the metal scene in decades. And while a lot of his solos sound like angry robots duking it out or a flock of evil space chickens, he's got a super melodic side too. The leads in songs like Sub Levels off of Destroy Race Improve or Straws Pulled at Random from Nothing really show off the melodic fusion-y side of his playing. One of my absolute favorite solos comes from one of their earliest tunes, Cadaverous Mastication off of Contradictions Collapse. On today's video, I'm gonna give you guys a detailed lick-by-lick -lick breakdown on how to play this awesome solo, and then we're gonna dive deep into the theory behind the chord progression and the scales and stuff he chose to use over it. As always, downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and so much more are available to everybody who supports my channel over on my Patreon page, patreon.com slash benellerguitars. This week, everybody who supports my channel on Patreon is gonna get a super cool backing track that I made that was sort of inspired by the chord progression in the solo section of this tune. That way you can practice some of these fusion soloing fundamentals yourself. So be sure to click the Patreon link in the video description below sign up today and start reaping the benefits. Frederick didn't record the guitar solo with this Sir Modern White Tiger, but I bet he wishes that he did. Today I've got this fabulous feline here running into an MXR GTOD pedal, just for a little extra boost before I hit the front of the Axe FX3. Before we sink our teeth into this feast of tasty licks, let's hear that solo again at stepdad speed. First things first, you gotta tune your guitar down a half step to play this solo. So I'm tuned E flat, A flat, D flat, G flat, B flat, E flat. But your guitar doesn't have to be a ridiculous animal print. But it'd be a lot cooler if it was. Keep in mind that to get that super fusion-y smooth, like Alan Holdsworth sort of sound that Frederick is using in this solo, you're gonna wanna try to pick as little as possible. So there's gonna be lots of hammer-ons and pull-offs and slides throughout this thing. First phrase here starts off on the third string and it concludes with a little dip of the bar. Check it out. To get that dip sounding super smooth like that, what you're gonna wanna do is to fret the note, dip the bar, and then gradually release your pressure on the note as you dip the bar down. And if your guitar doesn't have a kick stand on it, you can always just try sliding off of that note instead. Then we play this phrase, it's all on the dots on the second string. Again, one pick stroke right there. Don't overpick this stuff. The next phrase here is the only one that I'm not exactly sure if I'm playing in the right position. It is the right notes, but it's a little bit hard to find good live footage of him playing the solo so I can see what area of the neck he plays this lick in. But here's the way that I play it. You can even make phrases like that sound super fusion-y by not picking any of the notes at all and just relying on a little left hand hammer on from nowhere action like this. The next look that we play here follows the chord changes really nicely and features two bends. The first one's a whole step bend and the second one is a half step bend. And then we get this awesome wide interval tapping look that's not really nearly as hard as it seems. 
Something to focus on here is that the left hand is all on the dots, five, seven, and nine, and the tapping hand is only gonna be using fret number 12. So you can use those dots as a clear visual indicator of where your hand finger should go. Now you can either start this lick off with a left hand hammer on from nowhere on that fifth G, or you can fret it and lightly pick the note with your picking hand kind of on the neck like that. Either way, what you're gonna do is to hammer up that string right on the dots. Tap the 12, pull off all the way down, okay? And then we start the string crossing. Now after you learn this one lick, all you gotta do is then play that on the next string. You'll notice that you lead with the middle finger on the seven on both of these licks. So to start with here, we're gonna smoothly glide up and down that G string, just like your mother likes it. Then we're gonna lead with the middle finger when we reach the D string here. Hammer on, tap, and then just pull off all the way down. Copy and paste that same idea when you reach the fifth string here. Lead with the middle, middle finger hammers on, tap, and pull down the rest of the way. Kind of give it a couple little subtle dips with the bar after you land on that fifth fret A string note. Whenever you're playing licks like this one that feature a lot of legato and tapping and like zero picking, it's really easy to let your timing fall apart and sound like this. It's important to notice how smooth and even Frederick's timing is even though he's not picking any of these notes. So be sure to take your time with this one and try to keep your timing nice and smooth. Also, you don't need to use any kind of a fret wrap or dampener or anything like that if you know how to use your left hand muting to your advantage. You'll notice as I play licks like that that my first finger is staying nice and flat. I'm not barring the strings because I don't want to produce notes like that. I'm just trying to keep the underside of my finger nice and straight and aligned with the strings while being kind of like a soft capo. Then we get to the lick that features the most picking of anything in the solo. Starts off by sliding into the B number 12 and then restarts on that exact same note to play an ascending fours pattern. Meaning that we walk up the scale four notes, then restart again from the second note in that pattern, then restart again from the third note in that pattern. So it's gonna go like this. One more time. That concludes by hitting that same note again with a half step bend and kind of sliding off like that. And again, just be sure to notice here that we're only picking each string once whenever we can help it. So don't worry about trying to, you know, go nuts and like alternate pick your way through this or anything. We're only hitting each string once to kind of activate it and then using hammer-ons or pull-offs to carry us up the rest of the way. Myself, I find it easiest to pick that staying on the outsides of the strings. So I'm using downstrokes on the B string and upstrokes on the high E string. That way my pick never gets caught in the middle of the strings. Cool little dyad lick here on the top two strings. Starts off feeling like a C sharp power chord and an A power chord. Just kind of slide into the high E first like this. Notice that right there is kind of a little flat five interval, you know? And then slide down to the third fret for a little stacked up fourth shape. And then we got the last tapped lick, which is all on the second and third strings. I love how this one sounds. The phrasing here is a little bit weird, so be sure to follow the tabs and stuff super closely. Now again, whether he starts this off with a left hand, hammer on from nowhere, or if he's fretting it and sort of picking it up on the neck like that for a soft sound, I can't really say. Either way sounds cool. Just be sure not to really dig in too crazy if you're using the pick here. So again, right on the dots, easy to see right here. Five and seven in the left hand, 12 in the right hand. Then move it to the next set of dots, seven and nine in the left hand, and you're still using the 12 over here in the right hand. Then we're gonna go down here to the fourth position with the left hand. So 
So four, five, and seven. Before we slide up here to the ninth fret. Lose that lick again here. So that lick concluded with you on the ninth fret B. Now after this, what we're gonna do is to transition here over to using frets seven, eight, and 10 in the left hand, then tapping the 12 on the B again. It's pretty straightforward, just walking up, tapping, walking down that string. Before we move on to the G right here. The only thing that's kind of tricky about this lick is getting the timing and the phrasing down correctly on those taps. So coming out of the last lick, using your little finger, hammer on from nowhere on the ninth G, tap to 12, pull back off to nine, pull back off to seven, pull back off to five. Again, it's right on the dot, so it's kind of easy to see. Hammer back on seven, tap to 12, then pull back off those notes, then slide down to the four. Again, weird lick. 9, 12, 9, 7, 5, 7, 12, 7, 5, 4. And that is the entire fusion -y feast. Let's go through it one more time. So whenever guitar players hear cool fusion playing like that, the first question that they always ask is what scales are they using? In reality, Frederick is actually using some pretty basic stuff here. It's mainly B mixolydian and C lydian, which are really common scales that are just derived from the major scale. Nothing really all that fancy about them. The thing that makes it sound so cool is the chord progression. You gotta understand the chord progression here to know why he's choosing those scales in the first place. Because whenever you're trying to play jazzy or fusion-y stuff like this, the name of the game is choosing scales that satisfy the chord tones. What I mean by that is taking a look at the chord that you're playing over at that time and thinking about what intervals it has in it, and then choosing a scale that contains those intervals and paints the rest of the harmonic picture in a cool or interesting way. Now, I'm not exactly sure if I'm voicing these chords exactly the same way that they did on the record. It's a little bit hard to hear. You can definitely hear that the bass line is outlining a B, C sharp, and C. So underneath this B bass note, the guitar is playing this little cluster of notes. We have the root note B, its major third, which is this D sharp note. The open B string is again a root note. And then the high E string here, that E note, would sound out as a fourth or 11 against that B. So it kind of gives you a B major, with an added 11 sound. The next chord voicing here fits in really nicely with that one, and we can kind of group these two chords as fitting inside of one scale. We'll talk about that in a second. Under the C sharp, and yes, by the way, I realize this is actually a C since I'm tuned down a half step. We're just calling them like they feel, not what they sound like. We're guitar players, right? So underneath that C sharp bass note, the chord voicing sounds like it's doing something like this. Really nice angelic sounding chord. Again, there's a root note. There's our minor third, the E note, kind of implies this is some kind of a minor chord. That B note, in reference to C sharp, sounds out as a minor seven. So now we know that we're in sort of C sharp minor seven turf, and then the picture of that is completed when you hear this E note on top, because E, if you're asking C sharp, is that flat third interval again. So we have root, root, flat third, flat seven, and flat third again. So it's kind of a C sharp minor seven sounding chord. And then the last chord that we have here under the C bass note spells out as root, third, seventh. Because again, if you think of C, the B note right there is gonna be its seventh. And then that high third again, another E note. So that makes that like a C major seven chord. So we kind of have like B major at 11, C sharp minor seven, and then C major seven. 
Now the first two chords right there, the B major and C sharp minor sounds, those two chords fit together in two different keys. So he actually had two different options of scales he could use to solo over this. In the key of B major, B major is the one chord, C sharp minor is the two chord. So over those two chords, if he played the B major scale, he would have all of the intervals to satisfy all the notes in those two chords. You could kind of look at those two chords as being cut from the cloth of B major. But as they said in the Star War, there is another, because you can also form those two chords out of a different scale entirely, the B Mixolydian scale. Otherwise known as the E major scale, just starting from the fifth note. That scale right there has everything you need to build those two chords. So whenever he's playing over those two, he's choosing that B mixolydian scale because it has all the notes that are in there, as well as something a little bit unexpected, that A note that's in there. Neither one of those chords uses that note in it or anything, but again, he chose a scale that satisfies all the chord tones that were in those two chords, plus, as I said earlier, paints the rest of the picture in an interesting way. Your ear would kind of expect to hear the A sharp note right there, just to make it a plain old major scale, but that flat seven in there, that A note, makes it a little bit more unusual. It's just like a little nice twist of the ear. Now, whenever we get to the C major seven chord right there, this is where things get a little bit different because you can't build that chord out of that scale that he'd been using this entire time. That B mixolydian scale doesn't even contain a C in it at all. So there's no chance that you could make a C major seven chord out of it, right? So over this chord, he has to change scales. Now again, if I'm thinking about a C major seven, that's got root C, third E, fifth G, and seventh B in it. So C, E, G, B. I could technically play any scale over it that contains those four notes, C, E, G, and B. Again, you just gotta satisfy the chord tones and then fill in the rest of the gaps in a cool way. And the way that he filled it out is indeed very cool. Now here's the thing, a regular old C major scale does technically contain everything that I need to make that C major seven sound that he's playing over. So that would have worked, but it also would have been kind of predictable, right? So the cool thing that he does here is he actually plays a C Lydian scale. It's almost the exact same thing, it just features a raised fourth note. So if your C scale is like this, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, your C Lydian scale is exactly the same, it just features the fourth note, the F, being raised up a half step. C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C. Again, that scale contains everything that's in the chord we're playing over. There's C, there's E, G, and B, but it just fills in the gaps in the harmony with something a little bit more interesting than a plain old major scale. Anytime that you hear, you know, jazz and fusion players playing stuff that you don't really expect to hear, or you're going like, man, what is that cool scale he just played over this major chord or whatever I'm playing over? It's almost never a straight up major or minor scale. I'm not going to say always or anything like that. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. What's with all the Star Wars references in this episode? But instead chooses to fill out the rest of the harmony in a way that's just more interesting by offering you a little bit of a twist. Now that C Lydian scale, interestingly enough, comes from the G scale. You could also say that's a G major scale beginning on its fourth note. That would give you all the notes of that C Lydian scale. So I really like the way that he chose to solo over this progression. It's really intelligent because he took a look at those first two chords and said, okay, I've got one scale that fits over both of those, B mixolydian. Again, could have used B major. It's got all those notes of both those chords in it, but it's just not really as cool as B mixolydian. And then whenever he encountered the C major seven chord in there, he said, I could fill that out with C major, but I'm gonna make it C Lydian with that cool fusion-y sharp four in there, just cause it sounds a little more fusion -ier. From what I understand though, Frederick isn't necessarily a super theory heavy player. So I don't even know if he really thought about it that way or if he just played around with patterns that he heard in his head until he found something that sounded cool. That's the neat thing about this stuff. It's like everybody has a million different approaches to it. And then at the end of the day, 
YouTube.com nerds like myself can peel it away and say, oh, that's what he was doing right there. But whether that's what he was thinking of or not, I really have no idea. I know that if you would have handed me that progression years ago and outlined it the way that I just showed you guys there, saying these two chords fit into one key, this chord fits into a different key, I probably would have tried to relate these instead of like being modal, like B mixolydian, C aeolian, or sorry, C sharp aeolian, C lydian. Instead of relating it that way, I probably would have looked at the parent scales of all those. So you remember how we said earlier that B mixolydian comes from E major? I would have just been thinking to myself, play the E major scale over these two chords, and then whenever it goes to the C, I'd be thinking, well, that's derived from a G scale. So, you know, I wouldn't have been thinking about it modally a couple of years ago. I would have been thinking about the parent scales and saying, use the E major scale over the first two chords, use the G major scale over the last chord. I think that was a little bit easier for me to grasp back in the day. That's not how I think about it anymore though, because if I'm thinking these two chords belong to E major, I'm gonna end up playing very E major stuff. That E note isn't really a great one to land on for that chord. It works okay for that one. But I find that these days, whenever I do think more modally and I say that's a B mixolydian thing, I usually end up playing stuff that targets those notes a lot better and sounds more melodic than I do when I'm looking at a semi-unrelated parent scale. It's really important just to try them all out and see what works best for you. So if you support the channel on Patreon, be sure to grab that downloadable backing track that I put up on there and try soloing over those first two chords as though it was B mixolydian or E major, and then try soloing over the last chord as though it was C lydian or G major. Thank you guys, as always, for watching this week's installment of Weekend Wank Shop. This is the last video that I'm gonna be putting up in the not so great year of 2020, and what a wild and strange year it has been. But I have to thank you guys so much for helping keep me sane during this year. I was supposed to be playing shows and touring and traveling and seeing you guys in person and stuff all year long, but of course, due to the complications of the global pandemic and stuff like that. All those plans got put on indefinite hold and I've spent most of the year in this apartment reaching out to you guys, making guitar lessons and stuff like that. And I gotta tell you, first of all, I really appreciate how much positive feedback I've gotten from you guys. I can't even tell you how inspiring it is for me to see all these comments that I've gotten from people all year long being like, dude, I'm stuck inside all year. All I have is my guitar and these videos and lessons you've put up have really helped me keep sane. I've gotten so many comments like that and that means the absolute world to me. But I gotta tell you guys, I appreciate you guys watching this stuff and allowing me to have a YouTube channel because that gives me something to stay busy with. Usually all year, like I said, I'm out there touring and playing shows and learning material and going to studios and recording albums and stuff like that. I haven't done any of that this year. Having to constantly put out new content here on my channel has really given me something to focus on because otherwise I just would have had all kinds of free time to think about all the gloom and doom surrounding the world this year. So I sincerely appreciate you guys watching these videos, helping pay my bills through them YouTube dollars as well as supporting the channel on Patreon and stuff. The Patreon community has grown like crazy this year and it has been awesome to have another way that I can communicate with you guys and help you all out with your playing and stuff like that. So thank you guys so much for helping keep me sane and busy during this chaotic year. I've got some big plans for 2021, including finally getting around to doing some merchandise and maybe even hopefully a book or something like that that I can put out for you guys. Be sure to let me know in the comment section below what you all would like to see on my channel in 2021. Hope everybody out there has a safe and happy new year. Thanks again so much for watching this video. Let's click it. More picking.